This is a Cambridge IGCSE physics paper 6 talk through from June 22. A student investigates the stretching of a spring. On figure 1.1, take two readings from the meter rule to determine the unstretched length, length zero of the coiled part of the spring. So read across from here, it's 21.3. Reading two, you read across from here, it's 22.8 and then work out the difference between those two numbers, it's 1.5. Draw a diagram to show clearly how you would use a set square to obtain an accurate reading from the meter rule. So if this is my meter rule, remember you need to hold that set square perpendicular like this. The student suspends a load of P equals one newtons from the spring. He records the new length L1 of the coiled part of the spring. That's 2.2 centimeters. Calculate the extension E1 using the equation length one minus length zero. So it's 2.2 minus L0, which is 1.5. And therefore the answer here is 0 0.7. Calculate a value for the spring constant K using the following equations. So P was one newton. E1 was 0 0.7. It says to include the unit, so the answer here is 1.43 Newton per centimeter. A student suspends a load of P equals five Newtons from the spring. He records the new length L5 of the coiled part of the spring. Calculate the extension E5 using this equation. So it's L5 minus L0, which is 1.5. So that answer is 4.8. Calculate a second value for the spring constant using this equation. So our new load is 5 newtons. E5 is 4.8. Give your answer to two significant figures. So that equals 1.04, which is 1.0. State whether your two values of the spring constant can be considered equal within the limits of experimental accuracy. Explain your answer by referring to your results. So our two calculated values are 1.43, 1.0. So to two significant figures, it's 1.4 and 1.0, which are not particularly close to being the same. So I'm going to say no. I don't think they, they can be considered equal within the limits of experimental accuracy. The two readings differ hugely of 1.0 and 1.4. A student improves the experiment by taking additional sets of readings, suggests the additional apparatus that the student uses. The way you'd get additional readings is you need to find new lengths and the only way you can do that is by adding more loads. Suggests how the student uses the additional results. They can plot a graph. The student investigates the cooling of water. The apparatus is shown in figure 2.1. The thermometer in figure 2.2 shows the room temperature at the beginning of the experiment. Record theta r. Read that nice and carefully for me. It's 23 degrees Celsius. The student pours hot water into the metal can. She places the thermometer in the hot water. She records the temperature of the hot water at t equals zero and immediately starts the stop clock. She measures the water's temperature every 30 seconds, and here are the readings shown in 2.1. Complete the column headings. And I think this is the thing with CIE. You have to read every word because it's not really clear where the question actually even starts. You don't want to miss any easy marks. So time is in seconds, and that temperature is in degrees Celsius. The student pours the water from the can into a measuring cylinder and records the volume. It's 196 centimetres cubed. State two precautions when reading the volume of water in a measuring cylinder in order to obtain an accurate result. So remember, any liquid will have a meniscus like that. So you want to read from the bottom of the meniscus, which means like take that reading there. And then view scale at a right angle. 
The student records the volume V to the nearest one centimeter cubed. It suggests why this is appropriate because the measuring cylinder measures to the nearest one centimeter cubed. Calculate the de decrease in temperature delta theta 1 of the hot water between times t equals 0 and t equals 60 seconds. So there's 0, there's 60 seconds. So what is the difference in these temperatures? Well, it's 9 degrees. Calculate the average rate of cooling using the equation. So what was our time frame? It was 60 seconds. We want to include a unit. So just sub in those units, it will make it so much easier for you. So the answer here is 0 0.15 degrees Celsius per second. Calculate the de decrease in temperature between times 120 and 180 seconds. So that was three degrees. Calculate the average rate of cooling. So we take that three, divide it by our time frame, which was 60, to get 0 0.05 degrees Celsius per second as our answer. A student suggests that the rate of cooling is lower when the temperature of the water is lower. State and explain whether the results support this suggestion. Yep, have a look. That rate of cooling is lower. 0 0.05 compared with 0 0.15. So we agree due to at lower temperatures, the rate of cooling is lower. The student states that most of the thermal energy lost by the water in the can is by evaporation from the water surface. Another student states that most of the thermal energy lost by the water in a can is by conduction through the sides of the can. The students repeat the experiment twice to investigate the two statements, suggest one suitable addition to the apparatus for each additional experiment. So in order to consider evaporation from the water surface, what we could do is we could add a lid. And then if we consider thermal energy being lost by conduction through the sides of the can, we want to add insulation. The student investigates the resistance of a wire. Figure 3.1 shows the circuit he uses. The student measures the current and decides he wants to use a lower current. He adds a variable resistor to the circuit to reduce the current. On figure 3.1, mark with an X a suitable position in the circuit for the variable resistor. So you want to add it in series. It doesn't really matter where it goes. I'm going to pop it here. The student measures the current in the circuit. Record the current shown in figure 3.2. So read it nice and carefully. It's 0 0.38 amps. The student places the sliding contact at a distance L equals 85 centimeters from B. He measures and records in table 3.1 the potential difference across the length of the resistance wire BC. Record in table 3.1 the potential difference shown in figure 3.3. So read the number of volts there. You can see it is 2.6. So pop that there. The student repeats the procedure using L values. His, his readings are shown in table 3.1. Calculate and record in table 3.1 the resistance R of 85 centimeters of the resistance wire using this equation. So let's take that potential difference of 2.6. Our current reading was 0 0.38. Put that into your calculator and you'll get an answer of 6.84. Complete the column headings in table 3.1. Potential difference is measured in volts. Resistance is measured in ohms. Plot a graph of resistance R on the y-axis, so that's in ohms against length, x-axis, start both axes at the origin, so that's y, that's x. Pick a sensible scale that occupies most of the graph paper.
So we are plotting these two columns here. So at five centimeters, we have a resistance of 0 0.53. 25 centimeters, 2.11. 45, 3.68. 65, 5.26, 85, 6.84. Use your graph to determine the resistance R50 of a 50 centimeter of the resistance wire. Show clearly on the graph how you obtained your answer. So we need to read up at 50 centimeters length of wire read across and we can see that the resistance here is 4 ohms. A student investigates the force required to break different beams made from a mixture of sand and cement. All the beams have the same cross section. Plan an experiment to investigate the force required to break the beams. The following apparatus is available. A selection of beams made from different ratios of sand and cement and of various lengths. Triangular blocks to support the beams, a meter rule, a selection of loads, you can also use other apparatus and materials that are usually available in a school lab. The student takes all the necessary safety precautions. You are not required to write about safety precautions. In your plan, you should explain briefly how to carry out the investigation, include a diagram if you want to, state the key variables, draw a table or tables with column headings to show how to display your readings. You are not required to enter any readings into the table. Explain how you would use the readings to reach a conclusion seven marks. So let's start with our variables. What's our independent variable? So what are we changing? It's the selection of beams, isn't it? Made from different ratios of sand and cement. I'm just going to go with the composition of the beam, i.e. the ratio of sand and cement. What about our dependent variable? What are we measuring? The load required to break the beam. Control variables are what we keep the same. The length of beam. Position of load. distance between supports. Remember, you always want to state repeat or at least three different beams. And obtain at least three repeats for each beam type. In terms of the results table, you're going to have type of beam and then load required to break the beam and that will be measured in newtons. I think I'm going to draw the graph at least the axes. So your independent variable, remember that's what you change, always goes on your x-axis. So that will be type of beam and then load required to break the beam. And I would probably recommend a bar chart here because that data is categorical. 